So today's uh, reading and gospel uh, both have a somewhat common theme, which might not be entirely evident initially. Uh, the reading to the the first letter to the uh, sorry the first reading that we had the letter to the Hebrews uh, speaks about the people turning against God. So uh, at Meribah and Massa, when the people who had been freed from slavery in Egypt were in the desert and they grumbled against God. Uh, at, at Massa, they, they grumbled against God for not providing water for them, so they were thirsty out in the desert. But rather than asking God, rather than uh, praying to God, rather than uh, going to Moses and saying, Moses, you know, God has shown us in, uh, through great miracles and prodigies that he will indeed take care of us, we're thirsty, would you mind having a word with him that he may provide water? But instead of asking God, they grumble against him and grumble against Moses. So, you know, God, through the, the, the ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, column, pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, all these miracles that the Lord works. Uh, manna, of course, uh, on a daily basis, and a double portion the day before the Sabbath. Long story, lots of miracles there that, that, that the Lord has shown that he will take care of them. Uh, but then as soon as they're thirsty, ah, you don't care about us. It's just, you know, it's just an immediate reaction just to rebel against God. So uh, this is, is what the, the, the letter to the Hebrews is, is reminding uh, the people of, that, that uh, very easily we can turn our hearts from God. The, the, the reading then, the, the, the psalm then goes on to, to repeat that whole uh, situation at that whole scenario how we should come and bow and bend low and kneel before God our maker rather than grumble against him and uh, rather than behave like our ancestors did at, at mass and the desert and they tried God they tried or God will say they tried me though they saw my work so that's what sin is you know a thought a deed an utterance that offends God it's a rebellion against God simply put it's often just simply putting uh my will in place of God's. God's will for us is always good. God's will for us is always actually the maximum of our happiness. God's will for us is the maximum of our happiness. God wants our happiness. Uh, very easily, though, we will begin to think that God's will gets in the way of our happiness, or God's will is opposed to our happiness. God's will will, will somehow be less. If I could just be on my own and do what I want I'd be happier because surely I know better how to make myself happy. That's what every child thinks as well. If I had this computer game and this pair of shoes and had a single room. Remember back in the day uh, when you watch TV programs and um, the Americans, right? They used to have like Sweet Valley High and all those Beverly Hills 90210, 90, 90, 90, 90, whatever it was called, 90210. Uh, they used to have phones, right, in their bedrooms. Right, with all with the cords, of course, you know what I mean? Or some had a really stinky uh, antenna that used to come out of the phone. And we were like, oh my goodness, they have phones in their bedrooms. Because for us in Ireland, there was one phone per house, and it was normally in the corridor where it was cold, uh, usually in front of the front door. You, know, somebody, you don't remember that. Uh, in front of the front door, so like, your phone conversations were always in the middle of the corridor. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Granny. Yeah, 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 I'll be over later. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I saw that movie. You know, you're trying to have a conversation with the whole family gathered around you, like, it was ridiculous. And then you see these American TV programs, like, oh, they look so rich. They've got a phone in their rooms. Now, kids, everyone has them. Everyone has them. Like, so we can get so easily distracted by all of these uh, thoughts that if I could do, if I had everything I want, if I could do everything I want, I would be happy. Rather than thinking, Lord, I actually trust you to provide for my happiness more than I trust myself. And that's, that is quite a statement. That is quite a statement. But somehow, the temptation, right? Temptation can actually form us. Temptation can actually give us the opportunity to grow in virtue. So temptation isn't... Temptation... How, how, how upset to say that phrase kind of carefully. Temptation isn't, it isn't all bad <laughs> in the sense that because of temptation, I can grow in virtue. Uh, the, some of the, some of the saints, St. Francis of Sales now, he's just a genius when it comes to, to encapsulating these kind of ideas. He says the very attacks intended to, to defeat us can become, in fact, the means to our victory. He says no matter what temptations may come to you, no matter what pleasure accompanies them, as long as your will refuses consent, not only to the temptation, but also to the pleasure, 
they should not disturb you, since God is not offended by them. So as long as we don't consent with our will, not just to the temptation itself, but also to the, to the pleasure of the temptation. You can, without falling into temptation, you can kind of be glad that you're tempted and kind of enjoy the temptation kind of thing. So he renounced both, and then he said, you've, you've won. There's an opportunity there for, for growth. You can imagine uh, a couple on a desert island out there in the Bahamas somewhere, and the, the husband says to his dear wife, you know what I mean, I'm just, it's just, you're just so amazing, like I've, I've always been faithful to you. And she says, yeah, there's no one else here, right? So imagine that same couple living in like Ibiza or somewhere, right, where there's like scantily clad people there all year, and then he says those same words, you know what I mean, I love you and only, I only have eyes for you. It's quite a different statement if you're living on Ibiza, right? I only have eyes for you when you're surrounded by thousands of temptations. So it's the same kind of idea. If, if, if we're surrounded by temptations, and we are, and we still choose God, that's a much greater mark of virtue than, than having no temptations and choosing God. So our temptations, is, this is how, like the genius of, of, of God. We would, some of us might think, well, if God just took away temptations, surely everything would just be better. It would be easier for me to be a saint. And surely he wants me to be a saint, so if he just took away the temptations, I could be a saint. But it's actually through the temptations that I can become a saint because I have to strive for virtue. I have to, to learn how to fight in this battle for holiness. I have to learn. And sometimes, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll fall or I'll fail, but then I learn about God's mercy. I learn to rely on his mercy, not on my own strength and not my own power. So even temptation serves God. Even temptation serves God in the end. So we're never, we're never abandoned to... to, to we never abandoned in this, in this battle. Uh, St. Catherine of Siena, she wrote something, it was very frank of her, very honest of her, to, to come out so openly about these kind of sins, but she said, uh, St. Catherine of Siena gives a sobering account of how on one occasion, the most awful sexual temptations buffeted her. When they were over, she complained to God about, about him apparently being absent during this time of temptation. The Lord's reply was that even though Catherine was only aware of the ferocious temptations at the time, he was indeed right there in the midst of them, giving her strength to make it through. And then St. Francis the Sales also writes, God is delighted when we resist temptations, even though we may feel slimed after them. You know, you may feel kind of dirty, you know. Uh, even though you haven't fallen, it's just the fact that there was a temptation. You know, this can sometimes happen also to, to people uh, who do Eucharistic adoration or spend some time in the chapel, you go into the chapel, and all of a sudden this thought just comes out of nowhere. You're, Where did that come? <laughs> and, but you just feel bad. And here I am, like, sitting in front of Jesus, and this, this thought in my head is disgusting. But, and you feel like, oh, I, I'm not worthy. I shouldn't be here, right? So... Again, if the temptation leads you to sin, then obviously that, that's, that's a bad thing. If the temptation leads me to grab on even tighter to Jesus on the, uh, at the foot of the cross, well, then I've won. And then I've won. And of course, those of you who are good at your spellings, sin and pride, what do they have in common? Right in the middle of both is a big, dirty eye. Sin and pride. It's, it's me at the center, me fulfilling my will, realizing my happiness regardless of what God says. We take the ego out and we're, we're left with a, a gap, a hole, a space that can be filled by God. So then rather than being full of ourselves, we can actually be full of him. Rather than having a, an eye in the middle, we can have the cross. And so we ask the good Lord today to deepen our trust in him. And when we find ourselves on the battlefield, surrounded by temptations, that we may use these opportunities to grow in virtue, to grow in faith, to grow in trust, and to grab on even tighter to him. Amen.